Welcome to another episode of Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. Today's guest is well known in South Africa, though he now lives in London. He's Andrew Feinstein, former ANC Member of Parliament, who parted ways with the ANC over its decision not to pursue corruption charges over the big arms deal in the early 2000s. Andrew wrote his first book about that called After the Party. Uh, then he moved on to devote his energies to the global arms deal. But before we get to that, a little background. Andrew is Jewish. He made a moving speech in Parliament about the Holocaust. His mother, a survivor of the Holocaust, was in the gallery. Uh, but Andrew met his wife in Cambridge, and she's Muslim. So Andrew calls his, his children Jusalems. Andrew, Andrew is, is in Cape Town with a new documentary based on his hefty book, this one here called The Shadow World. It's the first book on the global arms deal, uh, the, the global arms trade in 30 years. The last one was also by someone with the South African connections, Anthony Sampson, who was the editor of Drum in the famous days of the, of the, uh, of the 1950s, and it was called The Arms Bazaar. Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Andrew, you've moved on from your life as a South African politician. Is that forever? Is there something that could make you come back and be active here? There's an enormous amount that could, that could bring me back here. I think the only thing that keeps me away is the fact that my children are at school in London now and are very much Londoners. But I miss the country terribly. I'm here a lot. I've been here three times this year. Um, I still feel engaged in South African politics. I follow them very closely. I write and speak about them a great deal here and all over the world. So I feel, I feel very much a part of South Africa, even though I live but at a distance. Could you see a role for yourself again in politics? Well, you know, people often say to me, do I miss politics? And I feel as though I'm more involved in politics in the work that I do now mm. than I ever was as an MP. And I think maybe being a part of a political party is probably not the way forward for me. I think that I found a space for myself as an investigative writer um, and filmmaker and as a political activist and campaigner around issues of corruption, governance and, and the arms trade. Well, that brings us to the thick of it. You decided not to testify to the Sariti Commission, uh, which was on the arms deal. As I recall, that was because there was a container load of evidence which the Commission de declined to open and examine. Well, that was one of the reasons. There was this, literally this whole trunk of millions of documents from previous investigations. They looked at only a small fraction of them. But as important as that was we submitted to the Commission literally hundreds of documents, evidentiary documents, evidencing the corruption that took place in the deal and they refused to consider them. They said that these documents had the status of stolen documents, even though they'd been in the media around the world for many years, um, and they said that the only people who could really speak to corruption to um, the commission were those who'd paid these alleged bribes or those who'd received these the, alleged the bribes. The perpetrators. Exactly, which was a complete nonsense. So the outcome was not a surprise to you? Well, the fact that the report of the commission completely whitewashes the deal and says there was absolutely no corruption in it and that the only problem with the deal are the critics of the deal, like myself, I mean, that came as no surprise to us. So South Africa is still paying for the, the arms deal. We haven't finished. Oh, no, no, years we haven't later. finished. I mean, we will ultimately spend somewhere between 60 and 70 billion rand and the contracts only run out in 2018. So we're paying that money until then often for weapons that we didn't need at the time, we still don't need today. That brings me to my next question. About two years ago at a press conference, I asked the current Minister of Defence how much of the arms that we bought uh, were, were available now in case of a threat. She said it was difficult to question and she couldn't answer it. She then referred me to the Chief of the Defence Force and he spoke at length, but he didn't answer it e either. Uh, as as we'll, people will remember, we brought, bought jets, we bought helicopters, submarines and corvettes, which are, were really frigates. How much of them are usable at short notice now? Do you have any idea? Well, we, we can only guess from the outside because obviously we don't have access to certain types of military information. But our guess is that anywhere up to 50% of this equipment probably isn't available to be deployed immediately. But that, as I say, is a guess. We hear all sorts of things from the military that it's all fine, but the reality is a few years ago, the head of the South African Air Force gave evidence in Parliament 
where he said before the Defence Committee that all the money was spent on the jets and trainer jets from our arms deal, um, which the Air Force didn't want, by the way. They wanted another jet that was cheaper. much cheaper. And that they don't have the money for the things they really need, which is the sort of aircraft you need to participate in peacekeeping operations, to assist in times of natural disaster, etc. So that in itself is evidence. We needed much more troop carriers and, and things exactly. to, to do peacekeeping yeah. work, which is what our army actually does. Absolutely, but also to help both within the country, but also in the continent with natural disasters, which unfortunately happen extremely frequently. And uh, the, plane, the jets we bought... Uh, my understanding is we've never had enough pilots, even for the old jets, which were fine at the time that we bought the new ones. We still don't have the, 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 the pilots, and we also don't have the funding either for full maintenance or to, for fuel to give them the kind of flying time they need to stay active. That's absolutely the case. I mean, all of the reports that we read in the sort of defense media is that they're completely underutilized, that both the pilots and the equipment, the planes, don't fly the sort of air hours that they would fly anywhere else in the world if they were being properly utilized. And it's because we spend so much money on the equipment that we don't have enough money to utilize it effectively, even if we did face threats. Yeah. Well, as I say, I, this was a very big briefing. Uh, it was an, the annual briefing of the, uh, the defense budget. And um, both the minister and the head of the military uh, spoke at length without giving me any answers. And I asked specifically about all four of those kind of weapons. We're going to take a break. But when we come back, we'll move to the global arms business and why it's such a big f factor that disturbs world politics at the expense of ordinary people. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm talking to Andrew Feinstein, an anti-arms campaigner. Um, Andrew, your film Shadow World has premiered in Cape Town's Encounters Festival. I, I must say, I expected something worthy but hard to watch. And what I got was riveting. I can't recommend it highly enough. It's powerful enough that you're aiming to release it in cinemas around the world uh, and submit it for Oscars and so on. It's not just another documentary. Is, is that correct? Absolutely. It premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York in April. Um, then went to San Francisco to a film festival there. We go back to the UK to launch it at the end of June. Um, then it has a European launch, and it'll hopefully be shown all over the world, both in cinemas and theatres, but also in communities, which is what we're doing here. We've had a screening in Lange. We still have another screening in Kaya on the 21st of this month. And yes, the idea is to take this film to as wide an audience as possible, both through broadcast and through cinemas and through community screenings. That's great. Um, now let's talk about what the film says. You chose, I think wisely, because it's such a big book and it covers such a wide uh, uh, area of, of activity, um, you chose a small number of issues of global importance, the way American leaders like Donald Rumsfeld were selling very dangerous weapons to Iraq's Saddam Hussein under President Ronald Reagan, and then was a leader in the plans to overthrow Saddam, claiming he had weapons of mass destruction, which by then he no longer had. Um, this process of the last 20 years has destabilized a very significant part of the world. Oh, absolutely. You know, probably the most conflict-ridden and troubled region of the world today is the Middle East. Yeah. And as Chris Hedges, a war reporter of 20 years for the New York Times, says in the film, the problem of the Middle East is not Islamic extremism. The problem of the Middle East is the arms business because the vast majority of weapons are sold into the Middle East and a vast majority of the money being made around the world, mainly in Western capitals in Europe and in the United States of America, um, are coming from the conflicts in the Middle East. And of course it remains with the Palestinian question, it remains perhaps the most febrile region in the world today. And the arms trade plays a crucial role in that. At the moment we are seeing all of the Western governments who produce arms and the United States of America selling record amounts of weaponry to Saudi Arabia. And it has already been shown that in its bombing campaign in Yemen, in its activities in Syria, Saudi Arabia is violating all sorts of human rights covenants, is violating all sorts of arms trade treaties, but the weapons keep pouring in because people in those Western countries are making so much money out of them. 
Yeah. And, and I mean, the interesting thing about Saudi Arabia seems to me, and, and perhaps you can tell me if I'm, I'm exaggerating, it seems to me that the Saudis get an enormous amount of weaponry, and yet they're still not able to defend themselves. Well, first of all, they can't defend themselves. They are dependent on particularly the United States. If Saudi Arabia was ever invaded, it would be the U.S. that would protect it. As it did, really, with the first Iraq war. Oh, absolutely. But even worse than that is that the Saudi royal family, which, you know, let's remind ourselves, it's a dictatorship, it's brutal. Um, women until recently weren't even allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. Right. Saudi Arabia, as a government, has beheaded more people in the last two years than any Islamic extremist movement anywhere in the world. Yeah. And finally, it is also worth saying that an enormous amount of Saudi money finds its way into these organizations that the US and Western government claims to be fighting against. So it's a ridiculous, vicious cycle that only makes the world a more dangerous place and that makes it more profitable for the weapons makers and the politicians whose political careers they fund. Now, the arms companies are so powerful with their lobbyists and campaign funds that they distort politics in democratic and um, undemocratic countries, even in the United States. Oh, absolutely. You know, the only way to understand the defense industry in the United States is to accept that it's a system of legalized bribery. Because you can trace quite openly money that has been given to political candidates. And those candidates, once in office, then ensuring that whoever gave the money gets as many weapons contracts as possible. So it results in a situation where nobody, not even Barack Obama, will speak out against the military-industrial complex. And today, the United States is producing a jet fighter called the F-35 that will cost the taxpayers of the United States one and a half trillion dollars. And according to an aerospace design engineer in the film who worked in the Pentagon, it's an absolute nonsense, this plane. It has absolutely no purpose in current conflicts, and it has all sorts of terrible, terrible technology in it that doesn't work. I want to be careful about how we characterize all of this, because uh, I worked in Washington, I worked in Afghanistan for the United Nations, and everything you say makes perfect sense to me. But I do want to caution or give you the opportunity to, to, to speak out on this. On, you know, what is, is it a conspiracy? Um, is it a couple of people in a, in, in a smokeful room who get, it, get together and plan to rule the world? <laughs> or is it, as, as my sense of it is, uh, you get politicians who want to get elected. So they get money from arms dealers, so when things come before them, they're influenced by that. The arms dealers put, put um, yeah, yeah. projects in their constituencies. So it's, it's not that... A whole lot of people sit around saying, let's go and make war. <laughs> but the consequence is the same. Look, I think, you know, you don't actually need any sort of conspiracy theory. You don't need to all sit in a, in a dark room, smoke-filled room, making these deals. I just think that there is a political and an economic elite yes. that has enormous influence in the world and that there is an almost unsaid and unwritten understanding of how things work. And the arms trade is the most extreme manifestation of this because the relationships between the arms companies, the militaries, and the governments are so close. And everything that takes place in the trade takes place in secret. So they do all sorts of things that are really criminal in nature. And unfortunately, there are an enormous amount of individuals who benefit financially from this. But to call it a conspiracy would be wrong. This is, this is just how the 1%, if you will, Operate. And, and, and the problem is, I mean, a, a lot of the problem comes from lack of campaign finance controls. In other words, in, and we have this to a degree in South Africa, of course, but much worse in the States, where you can raise literally billions of dollars uh, virtually undetected, and that you cannot then run for office against somebody who has that kind of money without having it them yourself. No, absolutely. And, you know, the United States is the most extreme variant, but I think all countries of the world where we are lucky to, enough to have democracy of various forms the problem of money in politics and the relationship between business and politics is an extremely difficult one. And I think it's profoundly undermining the nature of governance all over the world, from South Africa to the United States and beyond. We have to take a break and we're going to go back uh, to South Africa for the, last se uh, for the last segment. Don't go anywhere.
And we're back talking to Andrew Feinstein. In our final seg segment, uh, Andrew, I want to come back to the implications for us as South Africans. Why do you think we in the new democratic government was prepared to go for a, a deal that was so corrupt? Surely, if we as a legitimate government want to buy arms and need arms, we can pick up the phone and call British Aerospace or put an ad in the paper for a tender. Why do you need middlemen who have to be paid commissions or bribes of any kind? You don't. I mean, that's the reality. And it's why it would be so easy to sort out the global arms trade if companies and governments were bound by law to reveal who their intermediaries or middlemen were, the arms dealers or arms agents, um, what they got paid and what they actually got paid for, you would take this whole problem out of the industry. But there is no political will to do that because so many people are benefiting from it. So the reality is that you have these people who ensure that the companies and the governments are one step removed from the corruption, which in many ways makes it easier to do. Yeah. Um, I uh, um, uh, was, oh sorry, my next, the next mm. thing I wanted to ask you about was the offsets. The offsets the, being the way that uh, uh, when the arms deal, South African arms deal was done, uh, it was said that for every uh, dollar we spend buying, buying uh, military hardware, uh, the company we buy it from will spend money investing in South Africa. I must say, when I first heard about the offsets, I thought it might be a valid way to get investment, but you, uh, ahead of me, had studied the arms sector, and so you knew earlier than I did that it would never happen, that the penalties for not complying were so tiny, so the arms dealers just built into their, their contracts that they could pay off the, uh, the penalties and, without worrying about it. My question to you is, were our negotiators, like uh, 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 former Minister Alec Irwin and President Tabi, Tabo and Becky, clever as they were, were they also naive? Were they out-negotiated by people who'd been doing this much longer than them? I think to some extent they were naive, but I think more important than that is that this is how the trade operates globally, the weapons trade. So it's an extraordinary thing that the World Trade Organization, which regulates trade globally, outlaws the use of these offsets that you describe in any major government procurement decision, except in the defense sector. And unfortunately, in the defense sector, they're used for two purposes. One is they give the politicians the ability to argue to their people that they're going to be all sorts of benefits, jobs and investment and foreign exchange and various other things, so that it sounds better than just spending billions on weapons that you don't really need. But the second thing that it enables um, them to do, the offsets, is to pay a lot of the bribes. It's, it's a very circuitous way of paying bribes to people. So we have the situation in this country where our Minister of Defense at the time of the deal, Joe Modise, signed the deal in his last few days in office with BAE and Saab, the Swedish company amongst others. He then became chairman of a defense company called Conlog. And surprise, surprise, a few months later, Conlog received the contracts to manage all of BAE and Saab's supposed offsets. And, you know, that made the company hundreds of millions of rands there and then, and therefore made Joe Modisa almost immediately a paper millionaire. I understand that. But, it, I mean, if someone had, uh, if they were listening to experts, I mean, you were reading, there's plenty of research studies that yeah, say the offsets don't work. Um, they didn't have to accept the offsets. They could have said, we're going to buy this, and that's what we're going to pay for it. No, no, except that we wanted to do the deal in the very dodgy ways in which deals are done all over the world. And why was that? Because we wanted the bribes. I think we need to understand that. We wanted the bribes because it provides political solidity to all of the people who benefit from that patronage in the first instance. But second of all, it also meant that, you know, we could finance things like the 1999 election campaign as I the assume ANC. that was the, base, yeah. the basis. It starts with saying we need funds for our campaign. But, of course, once you get funds for your campaign, even if the principal, is, the principal person involved is honest, once 
he or she allows money to be given to somebody to pass on to the campaign, that somebody is, is inviolate. They can keep money for themselves. And there's nothing you can do about it. Well, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, there is overwhelming evidence of this having happened on our deal. There's a website called armsdealfacts.com, which people can look at. And we've put just a few examples through the Right to Know campaign of some of the documents. So, for instance, the guy who was heading the procurement in the Defence Force, Chippy Sheikh, asked a German company who were bidding for and won a contract for three million dollars. And there are actually records from within the company of them receiving this request, deciding to pay it, and even the Liberian company that Chippy had identified that they paid the money into. We've got very little time, and there are two quick questions I want to ask. One is a, a, a very brief economics lesson. Money spent on military is less valuable to the real economy than just about anything else, isn't it? Absolutely. The most important investments in a real economy are those that improve infrastructure. So telecommunications, the speed of internet, um, ensuring that your roads around the country are good. Because the money is, is recycled. Absolutely. But to put it into weapons is not productive at all. I have another quick question. You know, when in the, in the high moments of 1994, when we were all feeling so good about everything, um, we had all these friends. And yet it was our friends like the British, Lab uh, British government's Labour Party and the Swedish government, which we'd always seen as allies of the anti-apartheid movement. And yet they became involved uh, in, in the bribery uh, quite quickly. So my question to you is, isn't the only solution, I mean, it's, we have to engage with everybody, we have to engage with all these countries, but isn't the only solution for South Africans uh, that we have to build our own skills and rely on our own people who have our own, the, the right vested interests in the country? After 1994, for a few years, South Africa's democracy was unique in the world. The national interest was more important than anything else, than individual power interest, than party interest. And we can, we can return to that. The tragedy of South Africa is how quickly we became as bad, as tawdry, as corrupt as the rest of the world. We're not worse than the rest of the world. And we still have the energy, the hope, and the brains to lead the world in terms of the nature of the democracy we could create in this oh, country. I have to stop you there. We're out of time. Thank you, Andrew Feinstein. That's the end of our interview. I have, his, I have two books to recommend today, uh, both of them by Andrew. The first one is The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade. This is a hefty book. It's over 500 pages, 3,000 references. I guess that's to not be sued. Um, it's, it's a very worthwhile book and it's well written, but it's not for the faint-hearted. So if that's a little much for you, it's well worth reading, but if it's a little much for you, his earlier book on South Africa, After the Party, is still well worth reading. It gives you an idea of what happened here and what the implications were. Uh, and also don't forget to watch out for his marvellous documentary, Shadow World. That's our show. Thanks for watching. Good night, happy reading, and watching. <laughs>